Well, I've been really looking forward to this one. Really. John Bostock, but it's Bozzy, because otherwise I'll get confused. So it's it's Bozzy all the way through. Let let me give you some context. Uh, Everyone in football will know Bozzy, but if you're not a footballer, you might not. He's 31 years old. Um, He has the big ticket issues. Uh, He's been married for 13 years, nearly 14, to Sia. They've got Joa, their boy. Uh, He's currently playing at Notts County in League Two uh, and going along quite nicely indeed. And he runs an incredible organisation called Ballers for God. We're going to dig into some of those things. Now, I'm going to give you his CV before we get going. That will fill the podcast because he's been all over the place playing. He's played everywhere. Here's a nutshell, right? Uh, he was a palace as a boy. He made his debut as a 15-year-old in 2007, youngest ever at the club. Inundated with offers from all the top clubs in Europe, and I mean the top ones. Barcelona, writing to him personally through Ronaldinho, for example, to come. Uh, then Spurs come in for him. It costs him a few mil to get him. Uh, off he goes to Spurs as a boy and makes his debut for Spurs as a 16-year-old. He's at Spurs for five years. And lots of loans in that period, which we won't record. But then Europe, Belgium for three years, France for for two years, Turkey, back to France, then back to the UK, 2018-19, back to Forest, we're at Notts County now, I don't know if I should say that, as we record this today, and then Donny, Don Castorovers, 2021, and then Notts County in the 22 season. That's our context, he came to faith as a 16-year-old, and we're going to dig into that as well. Long introduction, Bozzy. Let me give you the first question to get us going for half an hour or so. What does it mean for you to have your sport and your faith connected? I I would use a very simple word and I would just say normal. It's very normal to have my faith and sport connected. Um, Growing up, I wasn't raised in in, in a Christian home, but when I did come to faith, I saw them almost as separate, but the Lord took me on a journey to show me that they're very much one. Um, And I believe that as people, as children of God, we have a wonderful opportunity to do whatever we do, whether that's cleaning, cooking, talking, speaking, playing, um, to advance one or two kingdoms. Um, And I know that, as the word says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God so that my career and my faith, they are united. And for me, that's very normal now. And if I had to describe you to somebody who didn't know you, funnily enough, I'd have said he's brilliant at being normal. I really would. Now, that ability to be normal, if you talk to any football managers, coaches in this country who know you, who know your background, that's what they'll say. Everybody knows he's a Christian. Everybody knows he's a committed pro. How did, can you remember, is it too long ago? It's like best part of 16 years ago now. Why was it normal? Was it normal from the beginning, from the moment you became a Christian? Why do you say normal? Just unpack it for us. I think, I think when you read the New Testament, I just think that there's this amazing person that we're introduced to. And when he's involved and he's in the scene, he now equips you to live a life that he sees as normal. Others might see it as supernatural, but he sees it as normal. So to answer your question, Dano, I went from living a very carnal life, a worldly life, a normal life, normal life in South London, chasing my dreams, trying to stay out of trouble, which was easy for me just because football was my God and goal. I encountered this Jesus and I encountered the Holy Spirit and I literally went from night to day so much so i remember i was exposed to the adult game quite quickly so i was around men very early even on my debut for palace i wasn't supposed to change with the first team although i did no one to just change but if they ask you just say you change in that in that in that coffee room around the corner just because i was a minor so i couldn't be around them but i'm traveling with these men so they're talking about adult stuff looking at adult imagery, all these things, all the things, things you can imagine that were going around the change rooms. I was part of that culture. That day I had an encounter with Jesus. I went from, you know, talking about all that stuff to now talking about things of light. And so 
I didn't know any other way. Mm. I wasn't raised in church to see a slow change or growth. I just encountered Jesus and the Holy Spirit changed me from the inside out. And he's been changing me ever <laughs> since. Yeah. What, what happened? Uh, tell us exactly what happened when you did encounter Jesus then. Well, I never heard the gospel prior to being interested about God. As we know, the gospel means good news, for those who don't know. Um, but I saw someone's life change, someone very close to me. Uh, my sister Tara, she's seven years older than me. And um, I grew up in what you'd call a kind of broken home. My real dad left when I was two months old, so I never, never met him. But my older sisters, they remembered him. So they had that longing for a father and would look for that kind of daddy love in wrong places. And one sister, uh, two older sisters, so my one, Tara, um, she really was off the rails. She started to dabble in uh, all sorts, mm. the nightlife, in witchcraft, and a lot of lot of things, because she was looking for answers. And all of a sudden, she's, she just became a new person. And I said, I said, what's, what's happened to you? She said, John, Jesus has changed my life. And my initial reaction was to want to laugh, because I never heard anyone say anything like that, but I couldn't laugh, Dano, because either she's lying, I was a placebo effect, or she's telling the truth. And I was just like, oh. Because I always had big questions, you see. I had a contract with Nike from 13, was courted by the biggest clubs at 14, made my debut for my boyhood club at 15. I had teachers in my school asking for my autographs. So everything that you thought a kid my age would want, I had, but I still realized it's, there has to be more. So I had big questions with no answers. And when I heard my sister's life, and saw it change, I was just amazed. Um, and she said to me, if you would like, John, come to church with me one week. And I went to my room thinking, there's no way I'm going to church with my sister. It's just not part of the plan. But the next day, my, my stepdad, who was by the newspaper, and on the back page, Kaka, who is probably, you know, one, one of the pinup boys for Christian, mm. you know, for Christianity in, 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 in the world of football, he won the Ballon d'Or trophy, which is the biggest individual accolade you can win. And the headline was, I give the glory to Jesus. I thought, oh, yesterday Tara's talking about Jesus. Kaka, one of my heroes, is talking about Jesus today. Maybe if I go to church, God can help me win the Ballon d'Or. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I went to church that Sunday, and to cut a long story short, I responded to the gospel. I heard the gospel message, and I realized more than anything, I don't know much about this church or this Bible, but this Jesus character, I need him. And I said a very simple prayer, um, but in that moment, I really ex encountered love like I'd never, never, I'd ne I'd never, I'd never experienced. Um, and it felt very simple. And then after that, the next day, I went to try to go back to live my old lifestyle. And it was like, you know when you put two magnets together, how they stick, when you turn them around, they repel, and that, 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 that repel started to be very consistent and slowly but surely I started to pray and read the Bible. I remember when I used to pray, about, I could pray for about five seconds, 10 seconds at most. God help me today, please help me not to sin and that was it. But over time, it started to develop. So that's how my life changed initially at the age of 15 when I came to know Jesus. So you'd made your debut for Palace at 15. Yeah. So you played in the first team, Yeah, Mahat. Um what was the first thing that you knew would change? You've described that day, your mm. sister. What was the most noticeable thing, if you can remember back in that first few weeks, you know, the magnets repelling? I, I mean, obviously you've got to be careful about what you talk about, mm. I understand that, but as you cast your mind back now, what was, the, what was the change inside and how did it impact your peers around you particularly? I think immediately I noticed, it's like my heart, my heart softened um, I, I grew up with a mindset of my my name, my fame, my story, my glory. That was kind of my four pillars. Although at the, that age I didn't I didn't label it like, like that. But when I look back, it was all about my name, my fame, my story. It's all about me and my glory. And so that's why in playing football and doing well, I'd be so high. In failing, I'd be so low, just because my whole focus is on my name. After responding to Jesus 
my whole outlook slowly started to shift and my heart started to be soft towards people. Um, and it started to become hard towards sin. What I mean by that is there were certain relationships I was involved in at the time that were very normal for a kid my age to be involved in. Um, and I tried to go and, you know, be in those relationships and I just couldn't. It was like a, someone else was telling me, John, this is not for you, my son. Mm -hmm. Now at the time, I just thought it was my mind, but looking back, I know that's how the Holy Spirit works. Mm -hmm. His voice is very quiet, but he's insistent, you know, um, in making us more and more like Jesus over a period of time. Um, and I was quite vocal with my faith at the beginning, to be honest with you, Dan, I remember. <laughs> The boys were like, yeah, but you only weren't church on Sunday. Now you're telling, you're telling us to be believers as well. Like, Where's this come from? Um, <laughs> it's because a reality of eternity and love and what Jesus has done for me. I fell in love with Jesus. Mm. When you fall in love with someone, you want to tell everyone about it. Mm. And um, people heard about it from me. So I think straight away, yeah, straight, straight away, it was first straight away. Week, it was, first yeah. week. And, and I, look, I, I look at my life now and certain gifting God's, God's given me mm. in terms of evangelism and maybe some you know uh, gifts he's, he's, he's deposited in me and I can see early how those were immature but there was definitely zeal there at, at the beginning yeah, yeah that, that leadership phenomenon or aspect of your character is obviously you, you, it's a God-given gift it's there from the beginning and so you led from week one as a sort of appendix there, tell us a little bit about the church then. Did you, were you, were, did you go to that church for a couple of years? Uh, I, I'd love to know where it was. And what role the Bible, because your Bible knowledge is good, you'll quote Bible verses frequently. You must have learned from very early on that God's word uh, is the food that you need. How did that pan out in the first few months? So I gave my life, I responded to Jesus in Greenwich, South East London, the Royal Bar of Greenwich, in a church called Christian Life Fellowship. And that's been my home church for all my Christian life, up until recently, just because I haven't been able to be down south in, 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 in England. Um, but I had a wonderful spiritual father, and I'm very big on um, mentorship and, and just fathering in general when it comes to the life of a Christian, um, just because, um, like in Timothy, the word says, like you have many teachers but not many fathers in the Lord. And I've realized we live in a culture where we want to do life alone. That's not New Testament. And I'm so grateful, Dana, that I had a man of God uh, over me um, who, was, who was able to tell me things I didn't want to hear. Um, and he, look, I was raised in a broken home, so I had a father figure, but in terms of really raising me with character, Christ way. I didn't have that, but in his name is Pastor Joseph Wedu, Ghanaian man. Um, and he passed, he went on to glory three years ago, and I miss him dearly. But now when I answer questions and lead people, I hear him through mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, Lord, thank you so much for, 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 for giving me that kind of leader. Um, it's a very servant hearted leader. He might not be known so much down here, but he'll be known in glory for sure. <laughs> um, and yeah, being part of his found, his foundation courses, his teaching, sitting under him for years, I realized that yeah, man can't live by bread alone. Mm. It's the word of God mm. um, that I need to make um, a high premium in my life. I remember in the early days, my youth Bible used to get dusty on my Bible. I remember it was on the side of my bed. It would get dusty and I felt like, oh, I've got to read this. Um, and I know that sometimes things are manual until they become automatic. And so it took time, um, but also my sister, who was one of the catalysts for me to know Jesus, she set me challenges. Okay, John, this week, memorize this Bible verse. Um, memorize, and she used to set me challenges and, and, and really um, helped me to make Bible uh, memorization part of my, mm. my weekly um, schedule. So these are things that really, really helped me early. And I love to listen to teaching. Um, the teachers that you listen to now, or that I listened to then, I wouldn't listen to now. Mm. But the Lord used to give me milk and I would listen to my podcasts um, and sermons on the way to school and it would feed me. And mm. I felt a difference. I felt when I listened to it, my faith was being stirred. Mm. And look, we know faith comes by hearing mm. and hearing the word. So I would advise any believer, young or old, like feed yourself 
Mm. Don't just wait till Sundays. Feed yourself. Learn to feed yourself. Um, it, it worked for me. In that period, uh, at Spurs, at five years, so it's a it's a substantial move for a boy. Uh, and you make your debut for Spurs at 16. But that next five years is is probably orthodox for most people. You know, if you're if you're a normal kid, forget 16. If you're a normal kid at 18, mm. uh, you've done your scholarship or you're reasonably exceptional, you get a couple of first team games. And then there's the loan system. First loan, second loan, third loan. When you're the superstar kid, where there's been a lot of antagonism about the Spurs move, uh, Palace Spurs jostling it out and fighting about it. Um, how did your faith, and we have a lot of young, we have a lot of parents uh, uh, of young athletes who are in performance pathways listening to this. In that window, how did knowing Christ alleviate, because it can't take it away, the pain of multiple clubs, multiple loans, probably thinking, what am I doing here? Mm. Give us a couple of minutes of a feel for, for a 15-year-old who's, who's feeling that pain now when they're not quite where they think they should be. And for mums and dads, what are your tips looking back on that from a Christian perspective and what you learned? Dano, without my faith in Jesus and God holding me through those years at Spurs, I really doubt if I'd be a footballer now. It got to a point, so just to paint the picture, I moved to Spurs at 15 and it was a talk of the press at the time. This is before social media, so it was more forums and stuff. I'm showing my age a little bit now. Some of the people are like, what's forums? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was, there was a lot of pressure on me. The club I supported since the Kid Palace, I had a season ticket there from five. I made my debut at 15, so that was my home. I went from being the blue-eyed boy there to mm. then receiving death threats when I left the club. Now, although I, I didn't believe any of those death threats would really come to, hap, come to pass, to be rejected by your own people, it hurt. I remember there was a sign, I left the club, I was only 15, and the next championship game that Palace pl played, there was a, a banner that went across 20 fans, it said, Bostock, even Judas is more loyal than you. Wow. And this is, I was only a kid, and I, and I would look at these things and read the forums and see it. Um, but you know what, Dan, looking back, God really, really helped me through the initial stages because my faith was high, I'm going to be a club, I'm gonna go and play in the Prem now, and I'm ready to take on the world. <laughs> Little did I know, God has taken me through a process and about to prepare me to go through what I like to be called the pruning phase. And I believe from the moment we become a Christian to the day that the Lord calls us home or he returns, we're consistently being pruned. But these five years, they broke me. They literally broke me. Um, and so I look back on it and the reason it broke me so much is because I had so much confidence in my sport. That, that basic, what I mean by that is I put all of my weight in performance, in football, in people's opinions of me, in, in being John Bostock, the wonder kid, and fulfilling that title. So remember, God had my heart at that age. So I was, I was leading a Bible study. I, was, I never went out clubbing, never drank a drip, drip of alcohol. Women weren't in the, in the radar. So I'm honoring God, I'm putting him first, I'm winning souls to God at a training. And on the pitch, it's just not going well. And the more I try, the more I feel like I'm letting it slip. The more I pray and fast, it's like, what is going on here? And it's because God still had to prune me and break me. And now I would have loved God to just promote me and me just to understood certain character things I should have known then. But you can know a Bible verse, but until you live it and act through it, it's not a reality to you. So knowing verses like Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord of all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll make your path straight. It's very easy to quote, very difficult to live out when you wanna let go. And you're like, where is God in this season? And so I went on loan several times. I remember coming off pitches um, in tears then. I used to go to the boot room and just cry. Like, God, why is it not working? Why is it so hard? I got to the point now, my contract expired at Spurs at 21 years old. Um, and all this time I had good people around me, my sister, I had my spiritual father, but they didn't really understand what football, the football sphere is like. You know, they didn't, they didn't get it. Like, people think that because you're an athlete, you're privileged, and we are but you still face real problems. 
Anyway, at the age of 21, the, the so-called wonder kid, my contract expired, I had no real interest, and I said, said God, my confidence is this low that if you want me to finish football and to go into full-time ministry, tell me now, I'm done. I remember praying so simply and I was broken. And Dano, I didn't hear the audible voice of God, but I sensed so clearly a response. And I believed God said, now you're ready. Do it for me, son. If you're not there, then how are they, how are they here? And I responded, I said, what do you mean now I'm ready? I've been ready all this time for breakthrough, why now? And then I sensed, I didn't hear him answer, but it was my heart, it was, now you're finally willing to let go of the one thing you were never willing to let go of, your name, your career. And the word of God says, whenever, if a man would seek to save his life, he'll lose it. But whoever loses life for my sake, he'll find it. What that means is if you hold onto things too tightly and they become your idol, you, you're gonna lose yourself. But if you're able to hold things loosely and hold God tightly, you'll find your life, you'll live in destiny. So that time, although from my, what seemed like my career and my, my flesh, it was awful, for my spirit and my character, it was wonderful. Um, met my wife there, I was able to really get strong roots in Jesus. And to anyone else listening to this going through hardship, remember the, the original intention for your life. It's not just to be a success, although that's hopefully will come. It's not just to be happy, although that can come. God's greatest desire for all of us, whoever's watching this, is to make you like Jesus. And one of the ways he does that, unfortunately, is through trials mm -hmm. and tribulations. So I learned that at a young age, and that brokenness allowed me to be rebuilt in the way that God wanted me to stand. So it's 10 years ago that, mm -hmm. effectively 10 years ago. Um, so that's when you went to Belgium, played for two good clubs, very good clubs in Belgium. Um, how did that unfold then? So naturally, we're hearing from you now that it, within a day of becoming a Christian, you're telling people it's clearly how you're wired by God to do five years thinking it'll the breakthrough will come yeah. 18 19 and it'll come I'll get in the first team I'll, and it doesn't come and you're off to Belgium did you go then you went with the assurance that you've just described mm -hmm. you gave it to the Lord and he said no no people need to hear mm -hmm. you need to stay in this John I'm with you I'm looking after you how was, how was Belgium initially? How did you adapt? First things first, I dyed my hair blonde. Because <laughs> it was like a new start for me. And although I had that revelation, living out a revelation sometimes is a process. So I knew in my mind, I'm not playing for my agent, not even for my family, not just, not just for a club anymore. I'm gonna try and play for God. And I, I said that for years before, but actually like, being able to enjoy the process is, we talk about this down every time we've spoken, a wonderful quote from a wonderful man of God is, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. To break that down, what that means is, God gets the most glory when we are enjoying him and enjoying the things he's called us to do. Now, football became a chore for me and a burden because I made it something it was never supposed to be. Sport is never a good, foundation for you as a person. Wonderful foundation for fitness, for career, but not for you as a human being. I learned it the hard way. So when I went to Belgium, I dyed my hair blonde, all right, new start, and I tried my best not to look at people's opinions of me or, or, or fans' reviews, but just to go into a game and play the game, like a kid again. Mm -hmm. So it was like I was able to tune into that kid who fell in love with kicking the ball against the wall for hours after school. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I played over 11 games in the season and I flourished. I flourished, I signed for Antwerp under mm -hmm. Jimmy Ford Hustlebank. Mm -hmm. And he, he was, I like to call him a destiny helper because at, at the time he was just right for me. He let me just play. He was hard sometimes on me, but he let me just play. And I fell in love with the game again because I was playing it for the right reasons. Um, so yeah, it was like a fresh start for me, Dana, if I'm honest with you. Blonde hair, let's go and play. And let's, let's build again the way God desi mm. desires it this time. So in that period, 
I mean, he's a great manager to have, isn't he? I mean, he he, he knew the hardships of football at the really top end, and yeah. so brilliant for him to look after you in that period. In that two or three years, Belgium, France, um, ballers, the idea of ballers for God emerged somewhere because around 2015 you get moving on that. Yeah. Who did you did you know anybody who had met with you? as a young Christian player from inside sport. Did you did you did you have company or companions like that to help you when you were in England? In terms of oh actually in the country? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking back now because we we've talked about how your pastor brilliantly yeah. helped you. Mm. Um but you're navigating something, as you said earlier, that you're however much people love you and bring God's word to bear in yeah. your life, there's something about the f- being inside a business, which you now do for thousands of people. Yeah. Did you get access to any of that? So, in terms of above me at the beginning, no. But then I was able to win some of my, some of my teammates to the Lord, and they became real peers and brothers mm. in the faith. But I look back actually, I was on a really low time on loan at Swindon, and Steve Miles. Oh, Miles! Milo, he came to meet he with came you. Came to meet me at what Swindon, a class and act. I was really low at the time, really low. And so, he was. An, he's an amazing man of God who met me where I was. And um, because I was also, you know, just being honest, I was like an example to some of the Christians around me. I felt like I couldn't really open up and be honest about some of my weaknesses. So to have him come, understand the game, understand the infrastructure of what it's like to be a Christian in sport, that really helped me. And so, um, yeah, that that was a, that was a real. Sh- it was only one or two meetings, but he would follow up on me and ask me how I was. So that was a key time in my one of my lowest moments. Um, and so, yeah, having help from that uh, angle now helps me to think, okay, who's in need that I am now coming, that I have contact with, um, just because players go through, th- people go through things that are not always seen. Yes, g- good. I, I, w- I was groping for that because I, I knew that it happened somewhere in your teens. Yeah. Uh, and that adds that little piece to the fact then that you've actually had some access to somebody inside the game who is a Christian and yeah. wants to care for you, when you start to get stability, serious stability, mm. enjoying your football again, it's not your idol. Well, it's a battle, isn't it? But yeah. it, Christ is king. Tell us about the original development of ballers, ballers and God, yeah. before it was ever called ballers. What was going on here? Yeah, so I started the Bible study in 2008-9 in, in Tottenham. So I had my own place, me and my sister lived together, which was amazing. And I would gather players from Spurs, from Arsenal, from North London, and some other players from around. And we'd come together and we'd have Bible study, fellowship, cell group. And that was great. So that was like the early kind of uh, taster of what was to come. And I remember one night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this like, grieve in my, this, like grievance in my heart. And I sensed that God wanted to start a movement through me, but I didn't know what it was. I wrote some things down, young people, sports, this, that, culture, um, and nothing came from it for a few years. Now, fast forward to 2015, Mm -hmm. I'd always kind of encouraged players along my journey, but this is one of the times when I now needed encouragement again. So I'm in Belgium, the language barrier, hurdle, training on Sundays, hurdle, not easy to get plugged into a local church. And this is long before COVID, so no online. Remember when churches went online and were equipped to reach people around the globe? My church went equipped like that from England. Um, and I sensed in my heart that I know I'm struggling. And if I'm struggling, I know there's other players out there struggling as well. You know, not able to be plugged in to fellowship. So I prayed about it and I sensed in my heart that God wanted me to start just a meeting. It wasn't a movement, just a meeting, just to encourage other players where we can come together, break bread, read the word and pray for one another. Just love each other and be with the Lord in that kind of atmosphere. So I called the first player, I think it was Benik Afobe, and I said, Benik, how are you? Okay, how's things? Yeah, yeah, football. No, 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 not football. How are you, Benik? He went, oh yeah, family this, going through that. I said, bro, I get it, I've been there. Would you want to come on, jump on Skype once a month just so we can encourage each other? And he said, yeah, I'd love that. So the first meeting in 2015, Dano, on Skype was I think three or four players. 
And um, it was so sweet. The fellowship, the conversation, prayer, we cried, we laughed. And it was that understanding of we get what we're going through. We get the challenges, let's support one another. And look, the word says, where two or more, two or three gather in my name, I am there. And whenever we gather in God's presence, he, his presence promises to be amongst us. And so we practiced that for months and the meeting started to grow and grow and grow. And it was a different um, kind of angle, you know, because Christians in sport was kind of men who'd run the race well before us or men who were not playing. This was the angle of we're playing, mm -hmm. we're going for it and we're in your changing room. Let's mm -hmm. gather, let's huddle like a team, like a changing room almost. And players invited players, we invited teammates and word grew. Um, and we realized that this has grown quite fast here. We need some structure. So we met every week, we changed onto Zoom and then we divided into three language groups. So I was so blessed to meet Jeffrey Sarpong, an amazing man of God, Dutch player. Ayong Eno, ex Cameroonian captain, the leader of the French group. So now the three of us lead those language groups and hopefully more will come. So we went from having four players in the first meeting to now we have access to over, well, the community's got hundreds of thousands, but in terms of players, like 400 players that we can like, we have touch points with hmm. every week. So that's how it started and, and you know, God's signature has been all over it from the beginning. How do you find the time? In the sense that you've got a day job and yeah. you love it. It's your football job. How do you manage that? You've got a family. Yeah, that's the bit, family. My wife, listen, I've, I haven't got it right always, Dana. I haven't. Um, my wife and I have had conversations about my timekeeping and priorities and I haven't got it right. But I believe this is something the Lord wanted me to birth. And that's the thing, God, when he births things, he doesn't birth it for you. He births it for the body. And so if he births it, if he's of it, he'll give you the grace for it. Now, with that, you need to grow in skill in terms of leadership and structure and strategy. And so I realized I needed more leaders. So we raised more leaders, put on more courses. You know, we really you know, we were able to, you know, gather some strategy and structure in place. Um, and if I'm honest with you, the biggest time saver and helper is prayer. That's been our engine, Dano. So every morning, without fail, from 7 a.m. to 7.30, a leader will be leading prayer. 360, 365 days a year. We've been doing that for the last four years now. And since we've really taken prayer to another level, we've seen more fruit. So, um, yeah, prayer is our engine. That's wow. really been, big, been a big That's help for us. class. So a player could come in to pray for half an hour yeah. every day, Online. any day, yeah. all year long and somebody will be there to facilitate that 30 minutes yeah. from ballers. Yeah, yeah, always. So we have that, then we have the midweek meeting with the Sunday Bible study. Now we have regional hubs once a month, end of season retreats. But these things came, they came after God gave a strategy. They came because we got some stuff wrong at the beginning. Um, and we still get some stuff wrong now, but um, the Lord leads and he corrects and he keeps what you should keep and he deletes what shouldn't be there. So. Um, it's really f amazing to see. I mean, I was introduced to a guy called Mickey Mellows for Christians in Sport, one of the one of the guys there. And when I first spoke to him, he said, John, we've been praying for stuff like this for years. Guys like yourself, Dan, guys like Linvoy Primus, these guys, they you've been holding the flag for years, praying for a bit of what we're seeing. And we're holding the flag for what we're gonna see to come. So although we're living in a bit of the answered prayer, there's more to come. So we just realized that in this time, we're gonna say yes to the call until we hand it over, which hopefully won't be for a long time, then we can hand it over. But yeah, this is not just us. We're building on shoulders of men of God, like mm. yourself. Well, we're all building on, on shoulders, aren't we? And, and that's the amazing thing about our mm. Lord Jesus, isn't it? Amen. Uh, that he gives us the privilege to have our little part in the game. Yeah. It's his match, isn't it? Let's go to two two more things, and I think as we as we start to land, um, let's go back into your career first, and then we'll finish with ballers as you see the future emerging. Then, so playing wise, uh, back to Forest on loan, then Doncaster Rovers. Um, you're back in the UK. Um, you sign for Doncaster. That's you, you go to play for. You have a very very good season indeed. Um, you turn turn down options 
I'm curious about this because you're not a baby Christian anymore at this point. You're leading many, many people. You had six months effectively where you didn't have a club. Mm. You were really standard at Doncaster. Everyone's thinking you'll get the next step up. You're still young. Yeah. And it doesn't come. That must have, to some extent, you know, I kept in touch with you a little bit then and I thought, God, that must be, that's a knockback. Yeah. Uh, now you're flying. Yeah. Of course, you, you, you got through the conference last year. You got a great club here, a big club, ancient club and real prospects for the future. How did you manage that end of season after Doncaster just a year or so ago and six months where you're not getting a job? How did you cope with that? I'll I take you back just a little bit, Dana. Mm. I was in Toulouse mm. and when I left England originally, I, I made a promise to God or I tried to make a deal with him. I said, God, within five years, I want to be playing in one of the top five divisions in Europe. That was my faith. I spoke that. I believed that and trusted God for that. On the, in the fifth year, I signed for Toulouse, Liga, Premier League in France. We did it. I'm flying. I'm enjoying football. But then in our family, our son has a health situation. And we now need to get back to England. It gets to the point now, it's not about football anymore. I need to put my son first. Not one English cub comes in. Not, not, they don't even show any interest, even on the free, not interested. I said to God, I said, God, I've tried to be faithful. You have to give me a club in England now. It's not, I can't divide from, I can't be away from my wife. We're a team. We've been in this since the beginning. That night, my wife had a dream. That I'd sign for a team in red. I had a red shirt in the dream. God gave her a dream. The next day, the window opens. Charlton coming for me. Deal falls through. I said, oh my gosh, what's happened? Red shirt. Red shirt. Yeah. Six days after, Aberdeen coming for me. No, stop it. They couldn't finalise the, 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 the deal between Toulouse. Another red shirt. I said, God, are you having a laugh or what? <laughs> Two days before the end of the transfer window. Nottingham Forest come in. I said, Lord, this has to be the one. The manager calls me and said, John, I want you to come in on loan. He said, can I have a permanent, please? Yeah. I said, no, it's got to be a loan. I said, fine. So I signed for Forest. And so I believe I've now received the promise from God. Mm. Dan, I didn't play that year. No. I couldn't get in the team. I was like, God, what is going on here? But away from football, my son mm. is growing. He's in a good environment. Family structure is good. So then we realised we need to be in England long term. I signed for Doncaster, another red shirt. <laughs> I have a good year there, although I get injured. Um, mm. Biggest injury of my career, coming back through that, finished season really strong. Offered a deal, turned it down because they got relegated and I wanted to stay at a higher level. Um, now, I had interest from good clubs in League One, but nothing concrete. So I'm training by myself, I'm training you know, in the gym, I'm training in parks. Then I called Forrest and said, look, can I come and train with the under 18s? I just need to be in that environment. Go train with under 18s. And I know people are telling me, you know, God works all things together for the good of those. John, you're going to be fine. And I, I think it, but my belief is like, where is this going to come from? But in my heart, I've always believed that the end of the matter should be better than its beginning. And my beginning was big in football. But my faith says my end will be, will be better. Might not be might not be more glamorous, but in terms of kingdom, it will be sweet. Now, I'm not at the end yet, but I was offered to come and train for Notts County. And I'm thinking, I can't go to non-league, with all due respect. I told Doncaster, I'm not going to League Two with them. So now I'm going even below League Two to the conference. But my wife said, John, just go and train and see what it's like. So I go and train and I'm blown away. The manager, within the first day, I said, if this guy's not acting, he's the best I've worked with. He's incredible. The players, the way the, the club set up, I said, this is amazing. And um, I took the leap of faith and signed here. So I went from starting the season, you have no club for four, four months, to then ending it by scoring at Wembley. Yeah. And helping a team, although I missed the pen at the end, helping a team <laughs> to get, Panenka. yeah, helping a team to get back to <laughs> the Football League, Dano. So, yeah, it that was. Is class, it's an brother. amazing turnaround <laughs> is in the year. So it was hundred points, hundred points. I'm mad. Yeah, yeah and, and yeah. Wembley. When you when you've been really low, yeah, those sweet moments are to savor for sure. Yeah, and that's where you are now. Yeah, and ticking along nicely in League Two. Uh, 
still only 31. Yep. Others will say that's old, but when you're old, 31 is nothing. <laughs> that's right, though, isn't it? Modern football particularly. It's true. Yeah, look, look after, after yourself. yourself. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's draw in then. It's been fun digging into some of these things with you. How do you see ballers panning out? What, what, what's your dream? What will somebody be building on your shoulders if Jesus doesn't come back? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I sense in my spirit and I've seen things the Lord showed me that it's, it's ball isn't God, B-I-G. So it's big. The, the vision he's given me is big. Um, already we've seen that there's a huge following just from footballing fans in general who have faith. Um, I've sensed in my heart possibly a club could come in one day a, a Christian club to start a Christian club could come one day we've seen it hashtag united it's a YouTube team that have come up that's down the line and academies and and these kind of things we've already got the merchandise which is really nice um, orphanages being being able to take players finances and to sow it into the kingdom is something I'm really passionate about but of all the thoughts Dano that are to come I'm reminded often that ministry is not a pulpit it's people is people and whenever I'm my mind is to think strategy uh, planning these are really important things but that last P people is something I, I can't we can't come away from so if I'm able to help one player grow in his faith grow in his career miss some of the hurdles I've been through but also hold his hand through some of the hurdles I have been challenges I've faced that's where I want to stay and want to be so I want to raise disciples who make disciples and continue to do that. By His grace, we've seen that. We've seen many players come to the Lord over the last few years. Um, but trying to keep the main thing the main thing is not so easy at times, especially when you get requests for talks and preaching and building and collaborating. But my goal is just to fulfill the Great Commission in and through the world of football. That the name of Jesus will be lifted high through the beautiful game. That will continually be my focus. John Bostock, thank you very thank you much that. indeed. Absolute pleasure.